Hello, and welcome to the Radiant Mission Podcast. My name is Rebecca Toomey, and I'm here with my awesome co-host and sister, Rachel Smith. Hi. (laughs) We are on a mission to encourage and inspire you as you're navigating through your life and with your relationship with Christ. Today, we are continuing to talk about the hot topic of injections. And today, we're specifically going to be diving into ingredients and some other things We have a wonderful guest here. Her name is Angela and she has been, hi. (laughs) she's been in healthcare for 15 years. If you did not listen or catch last week's episode, which I hope you did, I definitely recommend going back and listening to that one first before you jump into this one. But Angela exposes darkness. That's the short of it. And you can find her on Instagram at faithful underscore free underscore mama, M-O-M-M-A. She has fantastic resources. They are resources that I wish that I had a long time ago because it would have made life so much easier. So thank you for doing that, Angela. Yeah, for sure. Making it easy for folks to find the facts. Oh, well, I know we just talked about a lot in last week's episode And to kind of give a very quick recap, we talked about the schedule, how to communicate with your pediatrician, how to ask questions, how to do some research. And today we want to talk about ingredients. This is one of those things that once we start to dig into it, we can kind of see how maniacal these V's are. Because there's stuff that nobody should be injecting inside their bodies. But again, this is not medical advice. I am not a doctor. And a lot of this is going to be what I, whatever I say is my own opinion. So just ignore me. But make sure that the, you know, we want to remind you guys that the purpose of this is for you to make an informed decision for yourself, your body, your family, your children. Um, so again, you know you're going to hear my opinions and just ignore them or (laughs) listen to them if you like them. (laughs) But there are things like aluminum and formaldehyde, MSG, aborted fetal DNA fragments, fetal bovine serum, monkey kidney cells, mercury, and pig circle viruses, which is known as PCV1. And that's just to name a few. And sometimes it seems like because these things seem scientific or are scientifically explained away that we've somehow been programmed to believe that there isn't an issue with injecting some of these things. But the truth is that every single insert includes item 13.1, which is my favorite line of the entire insert. (laughs) And it says, has not been tested for mutagenic, carcinogenic, or impact on fertility. So we could pretty easily deduce that this is by design because such studies would likely produce some pretty terrifying results. And we know that many of these ingredients are carcinogenic because if you were to look, if you were to go to ewg.org to the water tap, the tap water database and type in your zip code, and you were to find that there's formaldehyde in your water, it'll tell you right there that it's carcinogenic. So it's pretty interesting um, little side note here, but we can really, you know, we can really point to some of these things, but the biggest one is to simply point to VAERS and that stands for V adverse event reporting system. And as of March 1st of this year, 2023, they have paid over $4.9 billion in compensation to families of children that have been injured by these. And one other thing I want to note is that it is estimated. I didn't note the study here. So ladies, I'm not sure if one of you remembers. Um, I think it was, it w- I think it was out of Pennsylvania, Angela. I don't know if you remember But um, one of the colleges did a study to see how effective this reporting system was. And they found that only about 1% of the actual injuries were even being reported to VAERS. So it was a Harvard Pilgrim study. Thank you. Harvard. 
Harvard Pilgrim study, they brought them in to see, you know, are, are people using this reporting system and found that only about 1%. So another thing I wanted to just note on here is that according to the 1986 act, the most amount of money that a family could receive, and this is only in the event of death. This is not for like, you know, my child develops this, these crippling seizures or anything like that. This is only in the amount of death. The most that a family could get paid out is $250,000. And this is from the government too, just to be clear, not from manufacturers of the injections. Absolutely. And so what I want to encourage everybody to do is go read this for yourself. Go read about the 1986 act. You can literally Google it. I'm going to include actually a link to it in the show notes just to make it easy for people to access. Read what the 1986 act is about because this is when things took a big change in the V industry. This is when the government started to protect these pharma companies from liability Because if anything happens to somebody from a V, it goes to a special court that is ordained by the U.S. government. Um, It is paid for by our taxpayer dollars. So we're the ones that are, these injured families, we're the ones that are paying for their injuries. If they even get paid, it, it sometimes takes a lot for somebody to even file a report. They may get, you know, gaslit into not um, filing a report. And this is also different from reporting it to the manufacturer, reporting it to VAERS. And anyway, go read the act for yourself because I mentioned last time, this was what really woke my husband up, was reading it in print. Wait a second. The U.S. government took liability away from the manufacturers of these products and they created a special court and they get to decide who gets paid and who doesn't. And they get to decide the line items and how much money. It's a little sketchy. But anyway, let's get back to ingredients. <laughs> now that is where you were going. <laughs> where I was going with it. Because, well, the whole point is um, people are getting injured and they're filing these reports for a reason. And they're filing these reports because there are ingredients that are toxic to humans. So let's talk about why aluminum and formaldehyde and MSG and mercury and potentially other dangerous things are being injected into our bodies. All right. Well, (laughs) great introduction. Welcome, (laughs) Angela. (laughs) I'm a lot of fun today. (laughs) All right. So um, I guess I'll take aluminum for 500. Um, So we'll start there. So yeah, aluminum. I I guess it's important first to to ask like, well, why is it even in there, right? Because if it's something that we're worried about, there's probably a reason that it's in there. So aluminum is what's known as an adjuvant, which is going to elicit an immune response. So all the different Vs on the schedule are made differently, right? Some of them use live virus, so they don't need aluminum in them, but some do not. So they have a weakened attenuated version of the original virus. So if that was injected without something to cause an immune response, you wouldn't get the desired effect, okay? So the aluminum is used to attach this virus to, and that's what's gonna make your body react and in hopes give you some kind of protection from this injection. But aluminum is very worrisome for several different reasons. So obviously we're provoking the immune system in an unnatural way, right? So when you encounter disease naturally, it goes through, you know, your nasal in through your nose and hits your mucosa or your mouth or things like that, like the normal routes, routes of transmission. Whereas when we're injecting something, it's going right into your bloodstream and your body doesn't have that natural way to fight off this illness like it would in everyday normal life. So one thing with the aluminum is because it's giving you this heightened immune reaction, there's definitely a lot of potential for bad things to happen from that. One of them being the development of allergies or other autoimmune responses from this interaction. As we know, aluminum is also a neurotoxin. So 
that's concerning. Um, recently, I don't know if you ever heard of the Informed Consent Action Network or in short, I can, but they actually did a FOIA request. So like a Freedom of Information Act request to ask, why are we using aluminum if we know it's a neurotoxin? What studies do you have to support its safety around injecting this in with these Vs? And through that, unfortunately, they found that neither the CDC nor the NIH had a single study that they could provide to say they had did safety studies to prove that it was okay to inject aluminum within these Vs. Also, aluminum has long been suspected for issues with Alzheimer's disease. I don't know if you've ever heard of Christopher Exley, but he's amazing. They call him Mr. Aluminum. Um, but he's demonstrated the link between that, between injecting aluminum and just aluminum and other things within you know, our environment as it's linked to Alzheimer's. And he did another study where he looked at the brain tissue of autistic children and found high levels of aluminum in their brains. So again, super concerning, something that we should definitely be looking into, but it just seems like it's kind of getting pushed under the rug a bit. And then some of the common arguments that I feel I've heard just in, you know, talking about this is, well, you get more aluminum in breast milk or formula than you do in these injections. So, you know, but really we're comparing apples to oranges in that, in that context, because there are two different entries into the body. So just how I kind of talked about earlier, which, you know, goes through your normal transmission versus being injected. It's the same thing. So one is being injected while the other is being ingested. So again, V's inject formula and breast milk is ingested. Yeah. So when we look at ingested, 99.7% actually just leaves the body through your GI tract. So in your stool. So when you eat for the baby's eating formula that has aluminum in it or breast milk, 99.7% is actually going to be leaving their body through their stool. And then the other 0.3% in healthy functioning, you know, babies and people will get filtered out through the kidneys. Okay. Mm -hmm. So not, not a major problem there, but when we do it via injection, your body is getting 100% of that in the bloodstream. So all of that mm -hmm. aluminum that's in that V is getting into your bloodstream, right? Yeah. So it's, and another thing too, when it's in the V it's meant to stick around, right? Because like I was saying earlier, that dead disease that's attached to that aluminum is there to provide immunity. So if that aluminum was in your body and just left right away, then the, the V wouldn't be doing what it needs to be doing. It needs to be constantly stimulating your immune system with that, what we call is an ag um, antigen, which is the disease. And that's what's going to keep giving you that supposed immune response. So your yeah. body's not going to excrete it. It's not going to do that because it's not going to do the job that the V is intending it to do. Yeah. Yeah. And then what's even more concerning about this, when it's in your bloodstream, they've done a couple different studies to see where the aluminum goes. Because if you're not peeing it out, if you're not getting rid of it, where is it going? Most of the time they see that it goes into the bones and the brain. Okay. Mm. Very, very alarming. And then just for like numbers sake, okay. To further break it down, breastfed babies on average get about 7,000 micrograms of aluminum in the breast milk, okay? Formula-fed babies get about 38,000 micrograms of aluminum. Those numbers seem high, but remember what we talked about earlier, ingested versus injected. So when it comes to the Vs, in the first six months, what your child will get if they follow the schedule is about 4,000 micrograms. Okay, that's not including the most recent one that was added, the C word. I don't know if we should say that or not. <laughs> That one that's been added at the six months, that's not, this is the Rona, that. right? The Rona. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so yes, when you look at it, as far as numbers, okay. Breast milk is higher. Formula is higher because 7,000 and 38,000 is higher than 4,000. But when we look at the math, when we look at how it's getting into the body only, so 0.3% that would be remaining after you poop it out, right? That only comes down to being about 20, or I'm sorry, 20 micrograms for the breastfed baby and about 115 micrograms from the formula fed baby. So that is way low, right? Compared to those yeah. original numbers. 
However, the V babies, you're still keeping all of that 4,000 that you're originally injected. And really it's like, a lot. it's the, the micrograms from the injection and breast milk or, or formula, formula because the baby has yeah. to be having yeah. one or the other of those. Yeah. Right. Right. Do you, um, do you know why aluminum is in breast milk? Um, because it's in our diet. Uh, so okay. it's not, if you look back years ago, like before we started using aluminum, it wouldn't have been in breast milk, mm -hmm. but now, like, I mean, a while back, remember when they changed all of the cans to not be aluminum because mm -hmm. they found that like tomatoes and the acidic properties in tomato was leaching from the cans and then they were having higher aluminum levels and then people were eating the aluminum, you know, or you use aluminum to cook on, you use tin foil, all of these outside sources, aluminum deodorant, whatever, all of these are adding to the already mm. burden that you have. And then your body is going to filter it out. And in that way, it comes out the breast milk. Mm. Okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wow. Yeah. I know. Crazy, right? Just <laughs> yeah. Toxin on toxin. On toxin. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so just to kind of tell you which ones contain aluminum. So, you know, I mean, you can tell by the insert, but hepatitis B, DTaP, Hib, pneumococcal, the hepatitis A, the combination hepatitis A and B, the, there's also other combinations with the DTaP, polio, and Hep B in one, one injection. Another one, which is DTaP, polio, and Hib in one injection. Meningococcal B, TD, and TDAP, and HPV. HPV has a lot. Mm. Oh, this. so maybe that's why the other vaccine reaction I had was as a teenager after getting HPV, and I immediately fainted after. So maybe it was just the aluminum shooting straight into my brain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm not. <laughs> but... yeah, they are giving HPV to children very young now. Yeah. I mean, well, when 11, they first 20. rolled that thing out, it was like, you know, they were targeting college students and, and females. Then, and yeah, females. And it just seems like it keeps getting younger and younger and younger. Mm -hmm. What's probably most disturbing to me on that list that um, you just listed is Hep B, which they get to is given in the babies. first day of a baby's life in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Wow, you don't happen to know how much aluminum is in just that one, do you? Um, I do. I have it in my notes because I want, I'm I'm very particular about being factual. Yeah. So I believe it's 250 micrograms, um, which is a lot for it. a newborn baby. Yeah, wow. it really is. Especially when the FDA's limit is supposed to be 25 micrograms in a day. Wow. So wow. I can't, my, I have tons of notes. We'll get to it. I'll, we'll kind of like circle back when I find okay. it. Better. So let's just do <laughs> a little yeah. bit of pin in it. <laughs> Sounds good. So that yeah. I don't... yeah, that just stuck out. In oh, my here mind. it is. I found it now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's 250 micrograms is in the hepatitis B. The limit, like I was saying, is 25 micrograms per day. But another fun thing that they like to do is the 25 microgram limit is based on a mice study. So not a human study. And it's adult mice, not infant mice. So there's just like a lot of things when you start to really dig into it and where they get their numbers and stuff like that. So like if I'm, I'm just going to keep going here a little bit. But yeah. like the FDA approval for this, for just aluminum in general and what's considered safe in a V is actually stemming around its efficacious level, not the amount that's determined to be safe, right? Mm -hmm. So what does the V need to show that it's going to be efficacious, not what's going to not harm someone? And mm -hmm. then when they look at safety limits, like I said, it's studies on mice. They're adult mice, so they metabolize different than the infant mice. Even infant mice are more advanced than an infant human. Right. So even using them isn't exactly the same as if they use infants, which obviously we can't do. I get that for ethical reasons, but just throwing that out there. Yeah. And they're always looking at ingested, not injected, where clearly I just made my point earlier that that is totally two different things and how your body absorbs it and uses it or lack thereof is totally two different things. And what's even scarier is these Vs are not weight-based. Mm -hmm. So 
a my like my husband, right? He's a decent sized dude. Whereas my newborn baby, they're not the same, but they're right. gonna get the same injection. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? Yeah. So that's really alarming too. So that just puts it into, into perspective because like you said, infants on day one of life receive about 17 times more injected aluminum than if we adjusted for body weight and dose than they should be getting. Wow. That's mm -hmm. scary. It's uh, very that's, scary. Yeah. And that's if they even needed that to begin with, right? <laughs> well, yes, because hepatitis B is a sexually transmitted disease or yeah. you can get it being an intravenous drug user or if the mother has hepatitis B. I mean, that's really where this injection started because it was to help babies from mothers that had hepatitis B to reduce the transmission there. And then for whatever reason, maybe they weren't making enough money. I don't know. This is just me being, you know, thinking not really uh, facts yeah. on this, but yeah. now they recommend it to every child on day one of life. You That's know. what happens though, with a lot of these is it's, well, these people fit into the mold. So let's just universalize this for everyone. And that's why I, you know, want to encourage everybody to do your research. If you do not have hepatitis B question this, you know, yeah, look into it. That one. What's that? Yeah. We don't yeah, yeah, think, exactly. just think about it. Yeah. I, I mean, even it's if you're concerned about the sexually transmitted aspect, then you can re- look at this later when they're sexually active, you know, right. if that's something you want to do, because we know that so many of these V's don't last, don't give you lifelong immunity. Like they, some of them claim they may be five years, they may be 10, you know, at best. So by the time your child's actually sex sexually active, are you even going to have any, anything left from it? You know, right. that's my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. So keep telling us about these ingredients. Yeah. So let's look at mercury. So just <laughs> yay, just mercury. With these neurotoxins. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so mercury we'll look at next. So another name that you're going to see it as, it's not going to be listed as mercury on the insert. It'll be listed as the Marisol. Mm -hmm. So in 1999, the AAP and the U.S. public health agencies called for a removal of the Marisol actually, because it turned out that the V's that we were giving were actually that were deemed safe were actually above what was safe, right? So they had to <gasps> no. take it. They had Shocking. It. Yeah. <laughs> figure. They were giving people poison for years? What? I know it's very sad. Like the DPT shot of yeah. So yeah. and they could remove this because this is a preservative. It's not the main component that elicits the immune response like aluminum is, right? So it wasn't an so adjuvant. It was just a preservative preservative okay correct yep and then so by 2001 it was actually removed from all the childhood v's except the multi-dose influenza and there's still trace amounts and in other injections as well but like the large amount was removed from it just a little bit of poison yeah just a little bit just and then <laughs> what's funny i think about all of this too is so okay 2001 it was removed but they kept it in the multi-dose. But then 2002, they then suggested the influenza to be on the schedule. Hmm. So Great idea. Sense, right? So we don't feel it's safe. Let's take it off. But then a year later, go ahead and put it back on the schedule in the form of the multi-dose influenza. So you can still get the single dose. And you could ask for that if you're someone that wants to still give that. And then that one won't have the thimerosal in it. But because of the preservative aspect and there's multiple doses in that vial, they have to have something in there. And that thing is the Marisol or the, the mercury. Okay. Oh. Right. And then there's, uh, there was a CDC article from 2017 that found the Marisol can actually damage the DNA as well as impair DNA synthesis, alter intracellular calcium homeostasis, disrupt cell division, lead to oxidative stress, disrupt glutamate homeostasis, decrease glutathione activity. So basically further weakening the protective agencies that you have in your body for oxid oxidative stress. So um, just something something I probably wouldn't want to eject, I guess is the point yeah, there. Definitely. Yeah, this right here is um, just has me screaming in my mind, autoimmune disorders. Right, right. Well, then wait, wait till this next one. This is <laughs> oh, right. This, this is, is going to be Rachel's favorite. To talk about. 
Yeah. <laughs> to MSG, not yeah. just Chinese Let's food. Ruin yeah. my life talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, yeah, this is kind of scary too. So MSG is classified as a excitotoxin because of the G in it. And this can actually cross the blood brain barrier. So if you're not familiar with that, it's the barrier that protects your brain from having things go in there that shouldn't be in there. So this can cross that protective barrier that's meant to protect your brain. It It's overexciting the nerves and it causes mal- different malfunctions. So as far back as 1950, we actually knew that just a single dose of MSG could destroy neurons in the inner layer of a rat's retina and severely damage the hypothalamus in the brain of that rat. And the scarier part, so we knew this way back when, but the scarier part is that humans are up to six times more sensitive to the effects of MSG than rats are. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. And MSG can be found in the flu mist, MMR pro quad, or chicken pox. Hmm. (laughs) That adds up. (laughs) Right. Go figure it again. (laughs) But really you can like, to me, there's so many different ingredients and I I mean, it's hard not to go down a rabbit hole with every single one, but for you to want to see the ingredients that are in this, you can one, look at the insert. However, there is something called a V excipient summary, and that's going to show you what is quote trace amounts. So they're Mm -hmm. still in there, but they're just small amounts. So they don't always list it on the insert. So you can just type in CDC V excipient summary. And you'll get, it's usually the first one that populates and you can click on that and it'll show you all of the different injections, the manufacturers, and then what's in them. So that's how you can see MSG, formaldehyde, you know, all of these fun things. Um, I also obviously have it linked on my, on my Instagram too. Okay. Wow. Perfect. That's so, oh, my mind is blown here, especially (laughs) because I've, I've researched this really what's happening to me inside my head right now is I did all this research years ago and then it was very recently that I had my genetic testing done and and found out my you know unique makeup and my um my genetic mutation that makes it so I can't convert glutamine into glutamate and all that and I did not put it together until you were talking about this just now of the two things so the fact that I had such a reaction to chicken pox as a child because my genetics have been the way that they were since I was before I was born it really is not surprising at all and it's it's disturbing and it's scary because you, you know, you were really talking about what a difference ingesting versus injecting is. Well, I have learned that even just me ingesting something with MSG, because it's an excitotoxin, it affects my brain. Like if I have overexposure just from eating it, then I am more likely to have like depressive episodes to have severe headaches to it literally affects my brain and the way that I process the world and what's really sad is I had severe anxiety and depression starting as a child and all through my adolescence and it's something that I've overcome in adulthood but this is this is one of the reasons like it's so important for us to talk about these things and for people to consider it because you know we we get told things like anxiety or depression or whatever are genetic or it's a you know serotonin imbalance or you know but there is can be root causes Mm-hmm. And to have no idea that the things that are going into our bloodstream can contribute in such a way that it to something that is really severe for our health, both physically and mentally, 
it's just really important. I, I just imagine when I was a 12 year old with severe anxiety, if my mom was equipped with this information, then maybe it could have been different how I would be later treated. I know that I feel empowered for my children that if I were to notice some of the the same things that I experienced as a child, I would absolutely be looking at their diet and the things that are going in their body. So yeah, Rachel, you mentioned, well, first of all, Angela mentioned blood and how these things are different when they're injected into our veins, into our blood. And so I want to circle back on the biblical aspect of this really quick, because in Leviticus 17, 14, we're told for the life of every creature is its blood. Its blood is its life. And we are injecting foreign contaminants in our blood that were made in a lab and studied on animals, thousands, probably millions of which have died in the study of these drugs. And so it's just something that, you know, we need to consider as believers, you know, the Lord is speaking to us and he's telling us your blood is sacred, your blood, your life is in it. And just as easily, if the life is in the blood, then, and we inject our blood with foreign contaminants that are toxic to our life, you know, we're essentially, what are we doing to our life's blood? It's just a question, you know, just something to, to consider. But speaking of life, there's something else included in the ingredients of many of these uh, injectables, and that is aborted fetal DNA fragments. This is pretty controversial because, you know, people will say things like, well, it was just one baby that they used back in the 1960s. It's no big deal. And of course, my opinion is, it doesn't matter if it was one baby or half a baby or a piece of a baby, a baby is a baby and it's a big deal. And one baby's body is too many, but that, again, that's my personal opinion. And this isn't telling the whole truth. There's, there's more to this story. And I've learned that from you, Angela. So please tell us about your research on aborted fetal DNA and the use of fetuses in jazz. Bees. <laughs> the bees <laughs> in the bees yeah so it's definitely more than one or two abortions because that's i feel like that's like a fallback you know or it was so long yeah. ago and yeah. to me it doesn't matter if it was you know 50 years ago or yesterday it's still yeah. not still a life acceptable and it's still alive correct so i'm not sure like one way to really that you can see how many abortions there it's been quite a few uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the deposition of Dr. Stanley Plotkins, but he was deposed by Aaron Siri in a case where a mother was seeking a religious exemption and they testify, they had him, to, um, Stanley Plotkins testify in the, for the, I guess, I don't even know, plaintiff, whatever the husband. Okay. I don't know the proper word for that, but the husband and Stanley Plotkins is basically the godfather of V's. Like he wrote the V book. He talks about them. He's mm -hmm. one of the creators of the rubella aspect of the MMR. Mm -hmm. So he was the one who uses the aborted fetal cells for that aspect. So Mr. Siri asked Dr. Plotkins in his work related to back to V's. <laughs> um, <laughs> Morris, I almost caught myself. Uh, related to in his work to V's more specifically around the fetal cell line WI38. So just to backtrack a minute, when I talk about that, the fetal cells, you're not going to see in the insert, it's saying aborted fetal cells. You're going right. to see it as a aborted number. human life. They're not right. going to say that they're going to, they might say like human diploid, okay. lung fibroblasts or something like that. But typically it's the number mm -hmm. and a letter. Mm -hmm. So in this what I'm talking about this deposition, Mr. Siri again asked Dr. Plotkins in his work related to V's, 
more specifically around the fetal cell line WI38, which is the one that he used to develop the rubella, how many abortions did it take to develop this line? Mm -hmm. His answer after he reviews his notes and his research was 76 aborted fetuses were used to develop and find a successful cell line to develop that one. Oh, wow. Right. So it is definitely a lot more than two. That is a lot of... And that was just that one. Just for that one Mm -hmm. V. So, yeah, right. Also, the abortions done in the 70s that they are using today to still continue to make Vs, they they have the cells in a way that they can grow them and replicate them and keep using them to grow viruses on. That's kind of what they use it for. They either take the virus from an aborted fetal tissue or they use it to replicate the viruses in, right? Mm-hmm. Cause I was saying earlier how um, we use attenuated for versions of it, which means you you're weaken, weakening the virus. So how they do that is on these aborted fetal tissues and cell lines. However, there's an end to how many times they can replicate. It's a very long time, but they have a limit. And when they reach their limit, obviously more abortions need to happen to get new cell lines to be created to keep doing this process. So the newest cell line that they created in 2015 is called Walvax, W-A-L-V-A-X-2. And it was taken from the lung tissue of a three-month-old gestational female who was ultimately selected from among nine aborted babies because the scientists noted that it followed the same guidelines to mimic the original one that they were trying to replace, which was the WI-38, as well as an MRC-5, which was another another aborted fetus line, in selecting this specific Walvax-2 baby. Okay, And they further noted how they induced labor using a water bag abortion to shorten the delivery time to prevent the death of the fetus to ensure live intact organs, which were immediately sent to a lab for cell preparation. Wow. That is sick. That's so they're, they're harvesting organs from a live aborted baby. Right. Is, so am like, I hearing that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. No, this is why it's really troublesome. So it's not that it's like you had a miscarriage and you they're using that, you know, baby or the, let me, let me just read this one quote for you. So this will give you a little paint a picture here. Okay. So this is a quote from a medical journal in 1952 about the, around the polio V and finding the cells for that. Okay. So it says, Human embryos of two and one half to five month gestation age were obtained from a gynecological department of a Toronto general hospital. No macerated specimens were used in many of the embryos. The heart was still beating at the time of receipt in the virus of the laboratory. That is sickening. The direct um... quote from research done in 1952. And it's unfortunate that many procurement companies are actually working hand in hand with the abortion clinics Mm -hmm. because a specimen that they need has to be quote fresh or it won't be viable. Yeah. It has to still be alive. I want to pull some, I pulled something up here because as listeners know, Rachel and I are pregnant. And so I have this app handy dandy. So a baby at four months is 16 weeks. And at 16 weeks, the baby's eyes are functional. The baby's eyes are working. They can already see. Uh, aside from just the heart is beating, the heart is beating, but these babies are expressive. They can frown. They can squint. Their skin is developing. They're growing bigger, stronger. Their ears are functional. I mean, this is a human. And you said from that quote, Angela, that it was up to five month aborted fetuses, correct? So it's a, yeah. So that's 20 weeks. And at 20 weeks, a baby could actually survive outside the womb. I mean, it would yes. take a lot of Nin- medical, but 19 weeks babies have, have lived, survived outside of the womb. So yeah, 20 weeks. I mean, this is so disturbing. 
Oh my gosh. You know, the baby's genitals have developed by 20 weeks. I mean, we yeah. know earlier and earlier, but that's very disturbing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this and is what we're using even... to create this, to create these products. We're using human right. lives that are removed from the womb alive and we're using them for scientific testing. Mm-hmm. So just to make that clear. And then like, as if all of this wasn't bad enough. I mean, that quote that I pulled wasn't even the worst one that I found. Oh my gosh. But it was the one that I felt was like a, a PG enough for this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But outside of like the moral aspects of all of this, there's also health aspects to it, right? So just like how I talked about all of the other ingredients, there's things that these DNA fragments do to harm us or have complications in us outside of, like I was saying, the moral aspect of it. Mm -hmm. So in the final product, you're still going to have DNA fragments and proteins from the original fetus cell line that they used. And these can be harmful. So some things that can happen with these, the DNA actually being taken, can actually be taken up by your DNA and inserted. So the DNA from this cell line, when it's injected, can be taken up by your body and inserted into your own DNA. Sounds like where we might be getting these gene mutations from, huh? <laughs> right. This The second way that your body can be harmed through these processes is the foreign human DNA can cause an immune reaction. And it, it actually made me think because like Rogam. Okay. That's exactly what happened to me. I had an allergic reaction to it because I had other people's blood injected into my bloodstream. Well, yeah. And so when you have someone else's DNA mixing with your DNA, it's it's so similar to you. It reacts to that DNA because it's human DNA, but it's not your DNA. So then yeah. it tricks your body to also attack your body, which is what an autoimmune response is. Yeah. So there's that potential. And then the last way is there's also retroviruses present. And these retroviruses can increase the DNA insertion. So as I was saying earlier, fragments of these DNA can be inserted into your DNA. And to increase that happening, if that DNA has a retrovirus in it, it'll even make that happen more, which Mm. is very scary. Yeah. So a lot of the research that I look at um, Dr. Teresa, Teresa Deicher, you can look up her website and she has a wealth of information. She's really studied this very thoroughly. Her website is soundchoicepharmaceuticals.com. But one thing that she covers is whenever a new V came out that used aborted fetal cells, there was a coinciding, coinciding, sorry, rise in developmental disorders in children as well. So that's anecdotal, obviously, but through her study, she noticed that when we start using more of these injections, every time we introduce a new one on the schedule that had aborted fetal cells in it, there was an increase in developmental disorders in children as well. So I think that there's mm-hmm. a lot more to this than we really have started to look at outside of like all of the other potential harmful ingredients. Yeah. Yeah. And one of her studies actually showed that healthy human cells can take up the foreign DNA spontaneously, transport it to the cell nucleus and then integrate it into our own host uh dna sequence like into our own genome wow so then now that gene is influencing how our genes work Mm -hmm. and what our genes go on to create in our own body and a lot of these have been mutated over time have cancerous aspects to them so to me that's just very scary we're distorting our own DNA. We're distorting our own blood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like you said, from the word, the life is in the blood. And I can't help but think that that is talking about DNA because the DNA is what codes our life. Right. It's who you so, are. Yeah. So to be putting someone else's DNA into ours is, this is why informed consent is so important and also why so many of us have taken up issue of 
being able to have religious exemptions for these things. I know when I did the research and and uh, found some of the, this information on this specifically, I honestly felt I cried and I felt like I had to repent. And I feel very passionate now about having being able to have a religious exemption because this is uh very personal to me i mean i won't even ingest certain things because i feel like it goes against my faith so it this does for me personally feel like an affront to my faith to be injected with something that not only contains this stuff, but even had this as a part of the research. I think yeah. one of the things that for a lot of us, you sharing this information, Angela, first of all, thank you for sharing it and doing the research for the listeners so that, you know, it's hard to come by this stuff and you're breaking it down in a very easy way for us to hear it and absorb it because it's very, it, it reminds me of the meat industry and how you know, we are so separated from the butchering process that we don't even know how, we wouldn't know how to butcher an animal if we needed to, because we're separated from that process. You know, we're, we're in a certain place. We go to the store, we buy the package of meat, and then we go home. And in a similar way, we take these, you know, V's and we don't think about how they're manufactured and how they're made and all of the steps that go along with it until we find out and then we're like, oh, well now I'm thinking mentally about what goes into this, a baby removed from the womb, you know, these ingredients pulled from over here, these adjuvants pulled from over here, these different ingredients, and they're all combined. And then they're injected into rats in a lab. And the mental picture is something that we're so separated from because we're not there. We're not in it. That I think that's what makes it easy for us to just say, oh, okay, you're, it's going to help me protect me from that. Okay, give that to me. And it's important for us to understand what is involved in the manufacturing of this. After that, I had the whole stint happen with Rogam and I started to research it and I found out that it came from pooled blood that all these random people were putting into a big vat and they were spinning it around <laughs> And literally using it to create this product and I had it injected inside my body, I felt sick. I was like, are you kidding me? For the 1% chance that, you know, I could have an, a potential issue. You know, first of all, even if you become sensitized, it doesn't mean that your child will end up with having rhesus disease. Like when you, like you said, do the research on, well, what will happen if I don't? And it took doing that for me to go, wait a second. I, God is not, he's not a foolish designer. We are the fools over here that are messing with his creation. And, you know, from my personal decision after that was, I'm not getting other people's pooled blood in, in injected into my blood where I'm told that my life lives. So right. anyhow, <laughs> Let's get back on topic here because I know you, you've got some stuff to continue with the human fetuses, but then, you know, I also want you to kind of give us some education on the monkey kidney cells, the animal side of things. So keep walking us through this. Sure. Yeah. So like I was saying, they grow the virus in different ways. So other than through the aborted fetal cell lines, we also use animals to culture things in. So monkey kidney cells is one of them. We also use um, maiden Darby canine kidney cells, or then that's basically like a cocker spaniel kidney. <laughs> so sweet. Yeah, that's exciting <laughs> to have injected as well. Uh, we use food proteins to grow things in like casein, soy, uh, gelatin, wheat, corn, egg, so all of these things that can potentially lead to further allergens, because again, mm -hmm. we're bypassing the normal way of getting things and we're injecting these into your body. Mm -hmm. um, and all of, uh, along with all of this, these 
animal cells that we use can also carry their own viruses in them. So there's that aspect that's kind of sketchy, right? Mm -hmm. So for example, in 1960, it turned out that one of the types of monkey kidney cells that they were using to grow the polio virus on was actually infected with a simian virus, simian virus 40, they called it, which is known to cause cancer in hamsters. But later on, dozens of other studies have also shown that it causes cancer in humans as well. Like mesothelioma is one of them. And then there's wow. a quite, quite a few other cancers that it causes. So then in <clears throat> the United States in 1963, they actually switched to a different type of kidney, monkey kidney cell, one that didn't have the SV40 in it. But the sad thing is, before they knew that it was in there, between 1955 and 1961, 90% of children and 60% of adults had gotten the polio with this SV40 to be potentially infected in those injections. Oh, so fantastic. that's a lot of people. Yeah. So it's in our, potentially our DNA. Right. So, oh. I mean, if you were injected between 1955 and 1961, so not you and I, but yeah, to add to it, this SV40, even though it was removed, it multiplies in, in human cells, which means it can be found in semen. It can be sexually transmitted. It can be transmitted from mother to child. So technically we can, if our parents had it, it can, mm -hmm. it could have been passed along to us from that. So right. no wonder why one in two people has cancer, huh? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons, <laughs> yeah. yeah. but over the years, like so many of these different viruses have been found and not really on purpose always. So mm -hmm. like in 2002, the FDA found DNA of a simian cytomega, I'm listen, I'm butchering this probably, but cytomega low virus in a bunch of oral polio injections. In 2010, a group of independent researchers researchers accidentally found that one that we were talking about earlier, the PCV1, which is the porcine circovirus in the rotavirus. So that was on accident. They found that one mm -hmm. in the road and that was in the Rotatech brand. And that one contained two different pig viruses. And what's even crazier is like, okay, you think, well, they found these viruses in these injections, then we should probably reformulate it, right? Just like we reformulated the one with the SV40. Mm -hmm. Well, the FDA came together, they assembled a committee to review this, and they concluded that the viruses most likely are not harmful to humans, and the benefits of the injection outweigh the risk. Oh my gosh. So we're like to me that that really makes me upset because when you come into the pediatrician's office, like it's in the insert. If you look in the Rotatech insert, you'll see PCV1 in the excipient summary. So is there a doctor that says to you, by the way, we're going to try to stop an intestinal problem, but we also might be injecting another virus into your child. Is that okay? You know, like that's, that's not part of the informed consent aspect. And now whether it harms people or not, I still think that should be on the table and that should be, you Absolutely. should be given that information. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Infuriating. Now bring us to fetal bovine serum, <laughs> meaning, you know, fetal, meaning fetus, meaning taken from the womb, <laughs> not to laugh about it, but uh, I've read about this process and it's horrifying. So I yeah. mean, the, the process for the human fetuses was horrifying. Well, so. that was horrifying. And I did not even realize that it was the exact same extent so yeah yeah like i mean with this I, what i always wonder too like why are people not up in arms about like the animal aspect of this so yeah. you're correct it's fetus so basically they take a pregnant cow and they slaughter it the uterus is removed the calf is then removed from the uterus and the umbilical cord is tied off and then they obviously they clean the 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 cow the calf and whatnot and then they puncture the heart to extract the blood out of the heart so just to be clear this calf is alive because they yeah. killed the mother alive and the baby was still alive because it was breathing off of its umbilical cord yep so they tie that off 
So in this process, like it really, the question is, does the fetus suffer when it's heart is punctured or not? Right. Because they think, okay, well, we tied off the umbilical cord. So now there's oxygen deprivation. It's separated from the placenta. So the thought is without this oxygen flow, it's going to prevent the brain from signaling pain. Oh, please. When that, when that injection is, or when that blood is taken out of the heart. Yeah. But what's really alarming is when they've looked at a couple different animal studies. So they looked at rabbits was one of them. Mm-hmm. And they showed when they looked at preterm rabbits, how long can they survive without oxygen? They can survive for 44 minutes being wow. deprived of oxygen. And other animals that they looked at showed very similar results that they can survive longer, these preterm fetuses. Surprisingly, they've never looked into calves. To see you know, that- I, it, just, uh, it just so happens that every single thing know. that happens to be important that needs to be studied in order to tell the truth is not studied, huh? You'll find... When you start looking into stuff for yourself, this is like me going on a tangent, but when you start looking into things yourself, you'll start noticing the way things are written, mm-hmm. right? Because one of the things that they'll say is like, um, we, there's no fetal cells in this. Well, you're yeah. right. There's no fetal cells, but there's fetal f- DNA fragments. There's fetal protein. So they'll try to say it in a way or... Uh, studies do not prove, or we cannot rule out because they haven't done the studies. So they can't right. prove it if they never did the study to prove it. So just always look at verbiage. And then like to keep going back, like to go back to the um, serum, like I was saying with the retrovirus aspect of the fetal cell lines, animals have similar things. So this this bovine fetal serum can be infected with viruses, bacteria, yeast, fungus, exotoxins, even prions. And studies have shown that between 20 to 50% of the fetal bovine samples are actually infected with a bovine diarrhea virus. Diarrhea? Yeah. Yeah. Bovine diarrhea virus. That's what it's called. And it also has extracellular RNA in it, this bovine serum, and it can't be completely removed. So when that interacts with your cells, it can cause another issue, just like the fetal cells did. And they knew about this virus too. So this is another thing like, oh, well, they must have just found out or, you know, maybe they're working on reformulating it. They knew about this since 1977. That's when they found out that the virus was in there. Yeah. And on top of that, even the interactions with some of these components with each other is a problem and or can be a problem Mm -hmm. so there was a study that looked at mice again they injected them with the pertussis toxin so whooping cough and none of the mice died when they just did the pertussis toxin but then when they injected them with the pertussin toxin and the bovine serum most of them died with n uh encephalopathy Mm. wow that's alarming because the MMR, the rotavirus, and chickenpox all contain the fetal bovine serum, and they can be given at the same time as the DTP, which contains the pertussis toxin. If you're following the schedule, it's a potential for them to be injected at the same time. Whew. Well, that's heavy. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is very heavy. You know, um, I know we've been walking through these ingredients and one of the questions that I had for you is to ask you as a believer and as a researcher researching this yourself, do you believe that God created us in such a fragile fashion that we would need to invent these products using aborted fetal cells, bovine, animal kidneys, formaldehyde, MSG, all this other stuff in order to live a healthy quote life. I mean, obviously I do not. Um, (laughs) What, what is troubling is like, even when I was first saved and became a believer, I did use these things, right? Because I didn't know that way. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying like, this is not to cast judgment. This is just to inform. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I did what I thought was right. 
with the knowledge that I had and I tried to keep my child safe. But knowing what I know now, things are completely different. And I definitely do not feel like they are necessary. Um, and I don't think God made a mistake. Like he knew what the world would be like years ago. He knew what the world would be like now. He knew yeah. what diseases would be around and how we'd get through it. So to me, I think he already made our body sufficient enough to be able to encounter and deal with whatever we're going to come in contact with. And we choose to maintain our health in other ways, more naturally, like I breastfed, which is something that God gave me the, you know, the ability to do, to give my child natural immunity, like natural immunity exists for a reason. There's a reason why when you get whooping cough naturally, you have lifelong immunity versus the injection. We're trying to catch God's design and we can't because God's design is perfect. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's my thoughts. So this has been a lot, but we still aren't done talking about this topic because we're never going to be done. We're going to do this for the, this is the rest of the show. <laughs> From this is our podcast. No, this is now our podcast. I hope you enjoy it because that's what it is. No, but we're going to, we're going to continue with Angela. We've got some things we want to circle back on next week to really dive into the 1986 act and share more with you guys on that. And to give, you know, some more thoughts to parents on this whole topic. So thank you so much for being here, Angela. Mm -hmm. You can find Angela on Instagram at faithful underscore free underscore mama, M-O-M-M-A. And thank you for listening and for being on this journey with us. If you'd like to follow along, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook too at The Radiant Mission or on YouTube to watch in video format. And today we are going to close with Psalm 127 verses three through five. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. And we're wishing you a radiant week. We'll see you next time. Bye.